Okay, well, welcome back and perhaps uh, we'll get started. The first session this afternoon, we're looking at monitoring relevant to the Shasta cold ball uh, management. And we're going to hear from two speakers in this session. Uh, first of all, well known to us from the last two meetings is Dr. Josh Israel with Reclamation. Uh, Dr. Israel is a science division manager in Reclamation's Bay Delta office. Prior to this position, Josh worked as a fish biologist for 10 years studying salmon survival in the San Joaquin River and Delta, drought impacts on winter run Chinook salmon, yellow bypass fish habitat and fish passage modeling. More recently, he has focused on leading staff to incorporate decision analysis tools into Central Valley project real time and long-term planning exercises. Uh, he's also been involved in establishing biological objectives to inform effectiveness monitoring, monitoring of Central Valley project actions. And also in this section, we're going to hear from Elissa Buttermore, uh, also with Reclamation. Elissa has worked for more than 10 years with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, working on teams considering and assessing listed candidate and proposed speech group throughout the US. A special focus has been on aquatic ecology. So welcome, Melissa. We're pleased to have you with the group. So Josh, over to you. Thanks, Peter. All right. Oh, hang on, maybe the mic is up. Oh, I mic'd up. So, <laughs> I'm going to look toward you because we, we have a, had a lot of comments on this end about people not being able to hear. OK. This oh, perfect. <laughs> all right. Uh, so hopefully I'll uh, keep you all awake after lunch and the great cake. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, monitoring relevant to Shasta cold water pool management. And I think Tom uh, had a one or two slides about uh, on this as well. Uh, we sort of divided it up. He was going to talk about flow and temperature um, monitoring. I'm really going to focus on this upper Sacramento River fisheries monitoring. Uh, and this, of course, is a figure you've seen from uh, what we call the sale paper from Rachel Johnson earlier that talked about using that conceptual model that we've presented during different committee meetings about stressors um, on different life stages of salmon. This is a uh, sort of the tweet that came out of that as the result in the discussion focusing on how to improve upper Sacramento River salmon monitoring. And so we're just going to really talk about what's going on here in this red box we have talked about some of the other pieces here when we talked about Old and Middle River. And uh, I encourage you to see the paper because there's pieces we haven't talked about um, in the Sacramento River as well. So uh, I think we heard about flow and temperature um, monitoring in Shasta Reservoir and in the tributaries and in the Trinity River system and in Clear Creek related to Upper Sacramento River cold water pool management. Uh, there's other things that go into our real-time operation monitoring associated with the proposed actions, such as the uh, construction and building of salmon red. So the timing and location is obviously really important. Uh, we do have some real-time triggers in our proposed action that in certain year types, certain tiers for cold water pool management to try to make sure that we're not wasting cold water early on. We wait for, in fact, reds to be constructed or see carcasses just to try to uh, not draw that cold water pool early in the year. In other cases, the tiers start May 15th, regardless, uh, because we know we have cold water, or we believe we have cold water available to us. Uh, the abundance of juvenile salmonids is really important. I think you heard from uh, Mike Farrell, another UC Davis Aggie today, a bunch of us are Aggies, uh, uh, talking about uh, the juvenile production index at Red Bluff Diversion Dam and the juvenile production estimate uh, entering uh, the Delta. And then the timing of juvenile out migration is also really important. We didn't talk much about the Delta cross channel gates, except I think in our first meeting, but the timing of juvenile out migration is important because it helps for some of our Delta operations. Uh, and also it helps for thinking about uh, our cold water pool management associated with uh, when uh, we think that uh, that uh, reds may uh, have all emerged, which in some tiers is an important characteristic of winter run Chinook salmon timing that allows us to potentially um, let up on some of the uh, cold water criteria. 
So what's some of the monitoring that's sort of coming in on a regular basis? So we have a really large carcass and red survey program. This helps us, uh, and it's when I say us, I'm talking about the Royal Us because it includes Fish and Wildlife Service, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Pacific States Marine uh, Fisheries Commission uh, as uh, consultants, contractors, and experts who are doing these carcass and red surveys. And again, helps us with identifying the timing and location of reds, which is used for initiation uh, and a location for temperature compliance. Red dewatering is important as part of our incidental take limit. We do have criteria in the incidental take limit associated with how many reds we can dewater for winter run Chinook salmon. Uh, this information was also really important as uh, Michael Farrell pointed out for sort of pre-2015 juvenile production estimates. But uh, when we had the 2014-2015 drought, we realized that the juvenile production index, which is the estimate of production at Red Bluff Diversion Dam, uh, would potentially be a better representation of production than uh, doing some uh, multiplication between the number of uh, females, the number of eggs, and uh, you know a, an estimate of fry survival above Red Bluff Diversion Dam. So we no longer use the sort of uh, adult escapement for the JPE. Then there's a lot of acoustic telemetry. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we use that in real time to help us uh, understanding out migration timing and survival. And it's being used in recent versions of the JPE sort of post 2015. So we also have a lot of status and trend monitoring. So uh, this is long-term monitoring that's been happening. A lot of these are the same surveys but just information is being used and consumed in different ways. So trying to use the carcass and aerial surveys to understand the estimate of adult escapement uh, that continues, even though it's not used in the JPE anymore. Juvenile stranding surveys is work Pacific States does with DFW, where they estimate the number of strand juveniles. This juvenile production index, which is our long-term, uh, sort of one of our longest term data sets on juvenile fish in the upper Sacramento. And then we've really started this long, it's what's become now, I think it's more than 10 years old, uh, a very robust acoustic telemetry uh, program where we get our basically seasonal survival estimates on numerous species. I'll we'll have a slide about that a little bit later. So first, maybe I'll just touch on the Upper Sacramento Adult Chinook salmon monitoring. So uh, this is a year round survey. Uh, typically there's boats on the water five days a week, two boats, so two boats uh, moving together through the four, uh, there's four reaches of the upper Sacramento. Um, they use a boat-based Cormac Jolly Seaver model since 2011. Uh, there's, uh, excuse me, so they're out every week. Ideally, the survey is done in three days uh, during a busy period uh, because they're doing it uh, for all the species, fall run Chinook salmon, late fall, winter run, and spring run. They're getting a lot of carcasses. It just takes a little bit longer than three days. Uh, goes from Keswick down to Balls Ferry, and they typically are taking uh, fin clips for genetics and also collecting some kind of pathology samples uh, when necessary. This uh, carcass survey started in about 2003. Prior to that, sort of the long-term escapement data was through those fish ladders that we saw uh, collecting silt at Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Um, and there's basically, you know, a, a five steps that they take to get to that adult estimate of escapement. So they're looking at the estimating the total number of females using a carcass survey. Then they uh, basically look at the number of males to females as a ratio uh, and uh, expand the number of individuals. Uh, and then uh, also add in samples that maybe were removed at the Keswick fish trap uh, for the hatchery so that we have a Sacramento, uh, upper Sacramento wide um, winter run Chinook salmon escapement or fall run escapement, in which case they're, I believe, including the fish that go into Coleman and are taken at the hatchery there. So moving on, we also have these aerial red surveys. Uh, these tend to happen from May through September. So these are a bit more focused on uh, winter run and spring run. And, and tends to happen from a helicopter or plane, like you can see this image here, which is really washed out. Um, there's some reds there on the river left edge there. Uh, happens about bi-weekly, depending on weather. Um, and this helps really, oops, 
the survey really just helps establish uh, sort of the area that then is used for the juvenile uh, or excuse me, the, uh, the red dewatering surveys later in the year. So the carcass surveys only go down as far as uh, Balls Ferry, which is above Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Princeton is much further down. So there's a large portion of the Sacramento River that they're looking for reds, uh, as you saw in some of those pictures from red distribution earlier. They're not seeing them down there, um, but uh, there's an effort put into to looking for them there. Obviously, there's no biological samples collected. So getting into the salmon red dewatering surveys. So again, the extent of this really is based on the aerial surveys, not the carcass surveys or red surveys. And the main focus is to estimate reds that are possibly at risk. So when reds are in water shallower than two and a half feet, they go ahead and measure those reds, add them to a spreadsheet, and they start tracking them as uh, reclamation starts to reduce flows, uh, typically uh, in September uh, and into October. Uh, part of that also is typically they also track the red emergence date. So they try to estimate uh, based on the reds, the earlier aerial surveys when those reds were constructed. And they're trying to track those so that once uh, we believe that fry have emerged from the reds, we no longer think that they're at risk. And we think that it's, uh, we, we, then we're willing to potentially dewater them. Uh, all this information is posted weekly uh, to estimate, again, the number of dewatered reds, uh, which is one of our incidental take limit criteria. Um, they also track fall run reds uh, and Elissa will touch upon some of the models that are used. So we've been doing this thing uh, as part of our current proposed action where the Upper Sacramento River Scheduling Team, I think Tom mentioned this group that is a sub-team of the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group. They tend to meet in the spring to develop a spring pulse flow study plan and develop a plan for how to deploy the water that's being provided for the spring pulse. And in the fall, we have an action because we're trying to get down to as low a base flow as possible to try to start rebuilding storage. So we're trying to do that in a way that balances avoiding dewatering winter run Chinook reds and also minimizing fall run red dewatering. So fall run don't come in and start spawning typically until mid-September. And so there's a lot of potential if flows are really high into September and October that you can have a uh, much larger uh, percentages of fall run red dewatering than winter run red dewatering. Uh, and so uh, some portion of our uh, new proposed or the current proposed action has this idea of uh, trying to uh, basically reduce flows uh, at sort of the optimal time and then uh, provide that water over a longer period in the fall. Uh, that water is being basically called upon to try to provide water for rice decomposition for diverters in the river, trying to see if we can move that around in a way that allows them to still get the quantity of water they need, but potentially a little bit later into the season of rice decomposition than earlier on. So, you know, for example, we know that they need, you know, 100,000 acre feet instead of providing 100,000 acre feet in two weeks, which would require a large release and then dropping it down, which might do water a lot of fish, trying to spread that over a month or six weeks over a longer period of time at a lower base flow uh, to, to try to avoid dewatering those reds from the first couple weeks. And this red dewatering survey is basically a way of enumerating that to try to figure out if it's working or not. We also have these juvenile stranding surveys. Uh, this goes down to Tehama Bridge, uh, which is somewhere between uh, a Princeton and, and Red Bluff Diversion Dam, I believe. Uh, is that is that right? Matt Brown from Fish and Wildlife Service is Tehama, Tehama Bridge. Is it above Red Bluff Diversion Dam or downstream of Red Bluff? It's downstream of Red Bluff. Okay. So uh, DFW and Pacific States do these surveys as well. They go out and they map these locations. They make some attempts at rescuing fish in them. They collect some biological samples and they use a depletion method where they you know go back and make multiple passes to reduce fish. Ideally, if they remove all the fish, then they can uh, estimate the number of stranded fish in that pool. And then they uh, use some estimates to figure out how many uh, individual adult 
months uh, worth of juveniles uh, are, are being stranded. They also use a lot of this information to try to inform uh, some habitat restoration later on to try to remediate and try to reduce uh, some of these stranding sites. Some of these stranding sites, you know, become stranding sites year after year after year because of the way that gravel moves around the river into side channels and things like that. So we also use this information to inform restoration planning. So uh, next I'm going to talk about turning to another kind of status and trend and uh, the uh, monitoring uh, that's also used for the JPE, which is this uh, Red Bluff Rotary Screw Trap Juvenile Production Index. Uh, I think we all saw yesterday uh, what was going on there. This is also a year-round juvenile monitoring program. Um, they have spent a lot of time. I encourage you to check out one of their reports uh, that Bill's put together. Uh, spent a lot of time working on trap efficiencies and building in a, a model for providing as accurate and precise in estimates as possible. Uh, they do anywhere from zero to 15 trials a year, typically releasing about a thousand fish per trial. Um, they don't use multiple size classes. So we've heard a lot about life history diversity and different size classes of juvenile fish. I think that's one of the difficult things. Uh, a lot of the screw traps is it's very hard for them to be using some of the larger size classes because they're so infrequently observed that it's very hard to get, you know, a thousand of them to then use in a, in a trial. Um, Red Bluff, I think Bill talked about this yesterday, it does sometimes have sampling gaps due to weather uh, and other challenges. Typically they're very small periods, but uh, probably does affect uh, the, the precision uh, and the estimate that comes out for the juvenile production. Uh, there's actually a lot of work, we're not gonna discuss it here, uh, going on uh, in another a technical group working on a spring run juvenile production estimate. And they're spending a lot of time working with some statisticians, developing some new methods to try to deal with when there are sampling gaps. Um, and I think that's really interesting and, and could potentially be applied to some of these other rotary screw trap sites that are really important, like Red Bluff. Uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service does collect a lot of biological samples and uses that for shoring up and improving the accuracy of some of the juvenile production estimate. And then uh, I just found this number related to precision and accuracy for fall run Chinook of plus or minus 35%. I think that's from uh, the Johnson paper also from the sale paper. So I was gonna touch really quickly. I think Eric also touched upon this is, you know, as we've got a new technology, uh, there's obviously been a lot of use of telemetry over the last 20 years. Say in the last 10 years, we've really made a uh, large effort to coordinate the telemetry across the Sacramento. Uh, and also we're trying in the San Joaquin Valleys. And so we've created this interagency telemetry program. Uh, 2017, we formed this interagency telemetry advisory group, all the agencies, as well as other participants um, can help with this collaboration, which is really focused on sort of a system-wide telemetry receiver array and an open data platform so that people can access information that other people are, um, are loading up basically as part of the system-wide telemetry receivers that are being coordinated. And then there's this web-based, these are all the, all the sites, um, where we have autonomous receivers. And then there's web-based reporting of for each study, sort of a biological summary, real-time detection information, uh, giving us real-time estimates of reach specific survival, and also some QAQC on our receivers to make sure they're functioning. And you'll see why I think on the next slide that sort of looks at just what happened in water year 2023. This is from, there's an annual report that gets put together. It was about 8,500 tagged fish that went out in 2023. Winter run, spring run, fall run, late fall run, Chinook salmon, steelhead and green sturgeon were all tagged. And we have real-time receivers as well as autonomous receivers. And you can see these real-time receivers that are really important for real-time estimation of survival and movement. And we have a lot of these real-time receivers also in the Delta so that as fish come out of the Sacramento or San Joaquin, we can see if they're moving towards the interior Delta. We'd like to think that that kind of information is helpful for, um, for understanding the movement of fish in the Delta, uh, given uh, the diversions and uh, inflow and outflow going on in the Delta and conditions there. So you can see we have about 14 locations of real-time receivers. These have very high detection rates. 
but we have hundreds of autonomous receivers that are being deployed by, there's probably eight or 10 different agencies deploying these receivers. And we have a uh, much more variable uh, detection rates on those. And a lot of that's because we don't have the information in real time to go back um, and, you know, uh, take take care of them when they go down. Uh, they're just being deployed for six weeks at a time, right? Sure. So an autonomous receiver is just a receiver. You put a battery in and, uh, can, you know, and uh, thumb, uh, uh, SDS drive and it goes out and it records the data and you come back and get it six weeks later. So it's just collecting data without bringing it back. The real-time receivers are all cabled um, like the camera there and are providing that information um, through cell phones, you know, every hour um, to a network that goes into that open data platform. That open data platform gets um, scratched off every day. That goes into survival models that gives us the survival information. Yeah, of course. Ah. Yeah. Uh, that's a really... Uh, a uh, terrible, um, terrible uh, figure. So this is, uh, again, this is from the Corleone uh, annual report. Um, so each one of these is a year. Uh, the upper um, panel is the basically four years, uh, 20, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Each one of those dots is a different release group. Uh, I think that the colors are uh, release groups of the same study. So uh, you can just see through time, we've really sort of like expanded this. Um, it started 2018 was sort of our first take on doing it in a more coordinated fashion. Before that, it was mostly academic researchers working independently. Um, and you can see, I don't know if it has, uh, oh, uh, there's also something on the bottom that says water year type. Uh, the lower panel is the delta survival. The upper panel is the river survival. And um, it, the, the top has numbers on it. Uh, there must have been something, I'm sorry, I cut off on the bottom, perhaps, that had water year type. And I think it's just pointing out that uh, in wetter years, like 2023, we had much higher survival for those fish that were acoustically tagged and rele released versus I think you've heard 2020 and 2021 were some of our dry and critical years. So those two left um, portions of the panel. Yeah. I'll send Laura the report. You can see it in living color rather than facsimile. Um, I was just gonna also finally touch a little bit about special studies we have going on. Uh, a lot of these are multi-year investigations as well that involve some level of monitoring. So I thought it would just be interesting to include them. So, you know, we've heard a lot about um, obviously growth of fish and like history diversity, sort of fundamental to that, right, is the environmental conditions, including the food web. So uh, we have a couple studies where we're looking at riverine, uh, food web investigations, some associated with habitat restoration, some associated with operations. Um, Rob Lusardi and folks at the Watershed Center are actually doing some looks at what's going on between Shasta Reservoir and downstream food webs. Um, again, habitat restoration effectiveness, we're starting to ex expand the biological monitoring we're doing associated with that. Uh, we're making uh, quite a few strides in trying to update our decision support models with what the models are telling us are the priority uh, studies and priority parameters to try to better understand to improve uh, measuring the outcomes we need. And so a lot of that's really focused on the early life stages, the, the egg to fry life stages, because we have a lot of uncertainty with you know, only measuring the number of adults and only measuring the number of fry and not knowing what's necessarily happening in between there. Uh, and a lot of that we've developed, not just as part of the CVPIA effort, but also as part of the Sacramento River Science Partnership that's developed a science plan. And thinking through how those science plan activities uh, can help reduce the uncertainty in these models. And so uh, one of the things that uh, a few of our technical folks did with other agency 
a biologist was work on an egg to fry value of information report where we developed a new influence diagram of sort of the egg to fry life stage to think about how all the different potential uh, hypothesized stressors or impactors or limiting factors on these life stages might be influencing the outcomes around growth and survival. And so uh, this report, which I'll also provide to Laura, starts to dive into that um, in the sort of things that we see when we went ahead and sort of tried to understand for each one of the hypothesized influences on uh, these life stages uh, was, you know, what's the importance, what's the, how much do we understand, how predictable, and what's the data availability associated with the information that we understand this, these hypotheses. And so I think Eric mentioned earlier, you know, we're really keen to understand in the field what's going on with egg to fry survival. So we're working with Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS uh, on a multi-year study to try to better understand some of the environmental covariates of egg survival and fry survival that end up leading us to the juvenile production that we estimate at Red Bluff Diversion Dam. And then on top of that, because it's very important and part of the insult take statement, also just understanding red dewatering as a component of that and seeing, you know, is, is 1% and, and I, we haven't gotten very close to, I think 1% of the reds being dewatered, but is there some value uh, in, in making sure that, you know, is 1% the right amount or, you know, are there other trade-offs there that we should be thinking about? So finally, I'll just leave you with, uh, you know, there's a lot of data sources as you're working on this. Uh, Cowfish, uh, SACPASS, the University of Washington website that aggregates a lot of the data. Uh, our website has our seasonal and annual reports on it. Uh, and the Sacramento River Science Partnership has uh, quite a few presentations as part of their annual and semi-annual workshops that they've been doing on these topics because they're of particular interest to a lot of us. So, all right, I think that's it for me. I think next up, I think is Randy, is that, that's what it looks like. Okay. Before we go to Randy, unless you want to go through all the presentations together, should we take a see if there are questions or is it just a good talk? Sure. No, I think we're. I think the way we set this up was uh, doing modeling for cold water pool management and then ending with a couple biological models that are part of the temperature management plan. Okay. So, but I'm happy to take any questions. Any immediate questions for Joe? Yes. Okay. You can only unfortunately operate either the lapel microphone or the handheld microphone at a time. So, name will switch over to the basic levels. just for my the screen. We're looking at the law, I have no idea. Um, it's, there's a pan over by the door. Someone was in the city. I hear you. <laughs> no, she's sliced. Oh, so you can do that on the campus. I hear you. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Josh, thanks for this. Thanks for the presentation. In terms of the monitoring overall, uh, uh, looking at Rachel's paper from 2017, which you cited too. You know, I identified uh, six system wide recommended actions to strengthen something's going on. How's that going? Go ahead, let's learn. Okay. Uh, yeah, go for it. Of course. Which uh, included uh, incorporating a genetic run existing uh, genetic run identification, uh, develop juvenile abundance estimates, collect data for life history, diversity metrics, identification. Uh, I'll collect data for like history, diversity metrics. I said that already expanding into this real time fish survival movement and monitoring, collect fish condition data, and provide timely public access to monitoring data and open data comments. Yeah. 
going to bring up any more of your sure. at the table. Well, well, I just say collectively, all those things are getting done. No. Um, I think I think you know what's interesting about that is that I think collectively a, a lot of those things are getting done, but you know the authors of that haven't gone back. It's uh, been what six years, seven years now, and we haven't gone back and inventoried if we're moving towards those recommendations. And I think you know one thing that someone brought up this morning is this idea of estimating the J like having a post season estimate of the JPE at Chips Island, which is so important. And that's actually something um, Rachel and I have been working with uh, some folks, bringing together uh, Russ Perry from USGS actually, um, on taking the Fish and Wildlife Services chip trawl data and Sacramento trawl data. The Sacramento trawl actually is where fish enter and the chips is where they actually exit the Delta, mm -hmm. taking that. And Russ has developed a model that pairs the you know, sort of occurrence data of fish there with acoustic telemetry and genetic identification data to come up with a estimate of the JPE entering the Delta and exiting the Delta. And um, that's, Rachel and I were sitting back there as Mike was talking about it, saying to ourselves, man, this project's almost 10 years old. And Russ, we haven't even put together any reports on it, you know, and it took us a couple of years and a long discussion to actually get the project underway. And I don't think we've, we certainly haven't provided any of that in an open data uh, form that people could access. And your question just encourages me to think that we, the authors need to get back together and try to summarize some of the key takeaways for each one of those recommendations, maybe for you and your committee, so that you can know that there is some traction on these things. And maybe that would help also with shining lights on things that aren't happening. Some are happening in relationship to regulatory things, steps, you know, um, and other things are just continuing to happen via university researchers working on them. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. Is Rachel here? We could ask for her thoughts on that. Uh, Rachel's here. You have any thread, Rachel? And please. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens when they give you the mic. Come on out. I was just going to add that um, that was probably one of the more gratifying um, synthesis efforts I have been uh, a part of. The IEP directors um, tasked us to look at the kind of holistic monitoring network for wind direction at salmon. And we had a bunch of agency scientists um, really familiar with the monitoring um, come up with the conceptual models, what we really wanted to be able to measure. And we saw a lot of deficiencies in the monitoring. We're spending a lot of money, but not getting a lot of quantitative estimates. And I would say, um, much to Reclamation's credit, a lot of those recommendations um, grew legs. And I think it came from the fact that a lot of agencies were represented in those technical groups. And so we were all able to kind of report up within our own agencies. And the directors felt like they had technical representation that they trusted for putting resources behind it. I haven't fully continued to track the progress, but pretty early on, like the genetic um, we're um, at Josh's leadership level, like a coordinated genetic monitoring program was stood up. So we actually now know who's leading at Chips Island, whether or not they're endangered winter run or whether or not they're fall run that we're trying to eat. And knowing which one they are is pretty important. And that has been a really incredible advancement. I think with kind of parentage-based tagging now being discussed, we probably, each of these recommendations probably should be re-examined to see if we're missing opportunities to learn together. Um, but I, I would agree with Josh that a lot of the recommendations have taken hold um, and that we're getting these kind of more quantitative estimates that now with Russ Perry's um, work, being able to look at the kind of post-season um, estimates of the production of fall run in, and winter run and spring run. Like he's working on kind of all estimating all runs because now we have the genetic information. So we made some kind of general recommendations. And I think that we still need to make more progress because I think that technology is allowing us to kind of dig in deeper. Thank you. So we'll go across to Denise and then come back to the Albert and on the other side. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
thanks for the summary, uh, Josh. Uh, one of the things that um, that uh, I, I read, you know, in the 2019 um, discussion of Chess the Cold War Four was, uh, and it's kind of implicit, I guess, in, in the concept of the of the tears and the idea that you know you squeeze time as well as uh, mm -hmm. as as well as the temperature uh, that you're going to. I was puzzled, yeah. and and it's there are a number of observations in there about the frequency of monitoring for reds and um, half a survey and things like that. And um, it gets. I was quite surprised to see you present that as real time biological monitoring because it's really not very real time, is it? Like every two weeks, some things are a week. I mean, how much could we change? It seems to me that, as Rachel said this morning, you know, we're trying to dance on the edge of the cliff here, right? How much How much better could we be in our management of water if we had much better information about when things were happening and where things were happening? Because it seems to me that that's what you're trying to get at with those tiers. But it seems to me that you, the information that you've got to feed it it's pretty coarse. And if that was better, maybe we wouldn't fall off the edge of the cliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a, uh, you know, great. So it's a good question or a good point. And I think, you know, it's hard to know what we should call real time, right? Is it like what we're measuring? like tidal velocity is at 15 minutes, you know, should we be using that kind of information to be making choices about diversions or about releases from Shasta or something because inflow drives the survival in the Delta of fish. Right. Um, but yeah, so two weeks, uh, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure like which specific one we should talk about, but I think for instance, let's take the example of if it's a tier two year and you're going to hold off starting your 53 and a half degree water until you see the first carcass. So there's some trade-offs there, right? You're already saying, hey, we're going to potentially further endanger some of the early spawning fish, right? So to try to provide colder water for lasting when you have more eggs in the gravel. Um, and I think, you know, it takes, we know it probably takes a few days to get, uh, uh, to find a carcass. It takes a few days for a fish to become a carcass probably seven to 10 days. So you're talking about two weeks after a fish is potentially spawned, right? So I think those are all kinds of things that we have a lot of lively active discussion and the technical groups about the temperature task group often gets into, well, you know, when should we start? We haven't seen a carcass and things like that. Um, I'm not sure that you can uh, get more on the edge of the of the cliff, you know, so. I think uh, that that's more of a policy choice than uh, than I think a choice that the monitoring folks are making. You know, like add adding another crew, right? Because you want to get more people boats on the water. Um, I, I mean, maybe that's a solution, but I don't necessarily know that that provides you with with actually more information or better information. Okay, can I just have a quick follow-up on that? Um, which is, and I'll just say, and oh. say it back into the microphone, but. I don't know if there's a real parallel here, but it, it seems to me like in the Delta, we went to EBSM, right? And we just put a lot more effort in some monitoring and giving it different ways to provide us better information. It just seems to me that, you know, there may be, this is a really critical issue, that there may be a different way of doing it that would provide us better information. There might not be a good parallel to EBSM, but we, sweep, we change things, right? And we're not changing anything. That's true. I don't think we've changed anything trying to manage to the tiers when it comes to monitoring. Thank you. Thanks for this interesting presentation. Um, yeah, you mentioned one of the special studies when we were in food labs. I don't think you know about the food lab context of the United States. This is a litigation concern to what extent it And do you have data on like insect production for this that would help globally in that? Uh, 
uh, another great question. So I think that's the kind of information that's being collected right now by the researchers. Um, and I think there is a hypothesis out there about, you know, is what, what's really going on with the food web? Is there some kind of food limitation? Uh, I, I think I, I think I saw a paper maybe looking at gro growth and temperature that Rob Lusardi's already put out that starts to address some of these issues also in a life cycle context, I feel. So let me look through some of the papers and see if I can, if in fact, I can share that with you. And I mean, yeah, we do have some, you know, semi-annual preliminary reports from researchers that have exactly the kind of thing you're looking for and that they're anticipating putting into manuscripts and reporting on, and maybe Laura can have them come speak sooner than later or something. So we still have a little bit of time. Are there any other questions from the community? Given that it relates to the, the question, the unpopular question, and that's Sarah and Rachel about all and global and trade offs. How are you all going about the time of that presenting some investigation of potential alternate management approaches to minimize the empty water? And uh, can you say more about how that's being thought about and also how the how the trade off between temperature and low volume looks in different circumstances, just to give a sense of like, you know, under what circumstances or is there more or less cross purposes between one or one and all of them? You get this, this theory to wait for it's not really like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks, Peter. Do you want me to walk around the table? Yeah, okay, sure. So I think, uh, so one of the questions was about, you know, what's the balance between releases in the fall for fall run and storage and temperature the following year, I think. That was the second part, right? Uh, maybe tackle that first by saying that, you know, I, th I think in our current consultation on the long-term operations, we've given this some thought and thinking about based on storage and inflow, what's likely to happen the following year. And I think it would be good for us to provide Laura with those reports and see if we can follow up by having some of the modelers come in and share that information with you rather than me trying to just butcher it. So... And then I think your first question is, is how do we go about balancing between winter run and fall run, primarily around temperature, but also around flow in sort of maybe more real time, I call it. So I think uh, the current proposed action, you know, has this rice decomp smoothing action. And I think for the first time, we tried to incorporate engaging with the other agencies that have interest in fall run management and try and also the settlement contractors thinking about their fall diversions and trying to figure out, you know, is there a better way of doing this than the way maybe we've done it historically or where we saw large, you know, large percentages of, you know, more than 3% of fall run reds being dewatered, let's say. Um, so, you know, we started, uh, we included a technical team that would have discussions to provide information to the decision makers to make decisions about fall operations. And so they've been, you know, going through a process where they've identified a number of performance metrics around estimating winter run Chinook dewatering, estimating fall run Chinook dewatering, looking at end of September storage, looking at flow patterns and looking at all those things, making predictions about dewatering and then providing that information through the SRTTG to the WAMPT and director's team and the Shasta planning group to make a choice about what to do. And so I think we've tried to increase the transparency around that. We've tried to increase the accountability and relevancy around that by actually having biological objectives rather than thinking about it just through the terms of what to do the end of September storage or what to do to, you know, uh, only one of the performance measures that we might have. Um, and I think 
it, honestly, it's it's like a really lively discussion amongst the technical folks. Um, and in the end, I think that lively discussion provides the consequence table to the decision makers so that they know if they're going to do this, it's what's going to happen with flow and the storage going into the winter, and also what's going to happen with winter run dewatering and fall run dewatering. Um, just, just one thing when you were talking about the aerial surveys and uh, helicopter and plane planning, that's really expensive. I just wondered as part of your review with scientists across the agencies, whether you've been looking at drone technology that could pick up surface water temperatures as well as uh, characterizing substrate and identifying reds in perhaps a cheaper way so that it could be done more on a custom basis rather than should on a flight time. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great suggestion. And I think, I don't know if they work for Eric at the Science Center, but there have been folks, um, what's what's Harrison's last name? Lee Harrison. Lee Harrison's done some work on the American River, looking at using drone footage or looking at fall run Chinook spawning. And I imagine that could be applied in other locations or I think what you're talking about is, are there other technologies as well that could be helpful for that kind of thing, right? Yeah, so um, I think there's some examples of that in the Central Valley, but it hasn't been used extensively that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, are there any other questions from the committee? Uh, what can we... <laughs> I, and this may not be for you, it might be for other, for other people on the panel, but I was trying to think back to Eric's talk and other talks. Have you seen a graph or some kind of a figure that shows us the biological benefit of using the temperature control program when it's fully implemented correctly in a year? Is there a positive response that is measurable? <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. So, so, uh, yeah, you're right. You're talking about monitoring afterwards. So I think, you know, last year was a very wet year. I think we heard a little bit from Tom about there was a good cold water pool. It was a tier one year. Uh, I think that a lot of the models estimated very low temperature dependent mortality, but in the end, uh, for many, for a couple different reasons, right? Fry production was low. Thymine deficiency, low escapement. Uh, com because of previous droughts, right? Compounding, compounding effects. So, um, but what I would say is that our models suggest that temperature dependent mortality is low, uh, but there are other factors that are causing causing winter run problems and causing production, right? Production problems for winter run. Uh, and I think Elissa will show in contrast a couple years of like, you know, a critical year and a wet year and show you how model predictions uh, that go into our temperature management plan do vary. And so our models are certainly sensitive to these temperature uh, predictions. Uh, and we really hope that uh, we can start to see higher production when we are controlling temperature effectively. Mm -hmm. So it's time you'd like to transition, maybe. Yeah, you great. Handle, you need to model. Yeah. yeah. So whenever you're ready. <laughs> you're very welcome to stay up here. And stay. Uh, so, so Randy, I think you're next up. Uh, Randy Field is a hydrologic engineer with Reclamation Central Valley Operations Office in Sacramento, California. She's worked for more than 20 years in the planning as well as the operations and has been intimately involved in real-time reservoir operations, system-wide water supply planning modeling at the Central Valley Project. Uh, Randy is currently the, the technical lead, developing temperature management tools and leading a reclamation science and technology grant research project to evaluate me meteorological forecasts for water temperature model. And so Randy, are you first up and we'll switch matters. Tom and Alyssa, please come and have a seat. Welcome. Um, I have a presentation to do with David, who's going first. 
Freeze the range of skids. All right, I'm going to explain how we're modeling now, but Randy is going to talk about the future and all the great things that he's doing. Um, all right, so currently we use HEC 5Q. So that's a Army Corps of Engineers model that was developed way back uh, quite a while ago. <laughs> so I, mean, I like to call it the Chevy, and it's the only bit of goody. It runs pretty good. It's still running, but uh, there's probably some new safety features we might want to add or things like that to that. But um, it uh, it's a physical model that's uh, one dimensional, so it's pretty bare bones, I guess you could you could call it. Uh, our inputs. Uh, it drive we talked about earlier um, how we developed a plan of operations. Um, that's our major input to the model. So all those flows into the reservoirs. Uh, we're looking at uh, what the profiles are. What is what does that initial profile in the reservoir look like to start to start the run? And then uh, what what we think our forecasted meteorology will be for the season for the temperature plan. And then. Um, we actually input the target release temperatures at Shasta. That's our, our uh, what we want to target as a release at Shasta. So outputs, downstream temperature at, at certain key points. We're looking at temperatures, um, uh, what those water temperatures are downstream, key locations, uh, and then looking at end of month profiles through the season so we can track what the model is uh, showing in terms of uh, uh, how the season progresses. And then the model also spits out how it, it models the, it manages the temperature control device. So we can uh, look into the model and see how it progresses from the upper gates all the way down to those side gates. So we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, we got Shasta, basically an upper stream reservoir. We've got a regulating reservoir. Uh, that release has to pass through that, uh, either coming out of the powerhouse or the outlet works. Uh, the river releases down through the regulating reservoir and then down through the, the river reaches. Um, also, you got to account for tributary flows. So Cow Creek or, or Battle or Cottonwood. Uh, a wetter year is going to have more side flow that's coming in, and those are uncontrolled tributary flows. It could be snow melt this time of year, but it could be warm also by the time it gets to flowing into the uh, the Sac River. So, got to take all that in account. And we we build a lot of that into the model. Uh, there's obviously a lot of um, finagling in terms of what we think the downstream tributaries are going to be, um, and what the what the um, that component is in terms of the downstream um, that's pretty much out of our control. So. so the model also takes a look at um, uh, the regulating reservoir. We talked about a little bit about that. Um, you know, if you're releasing, not making a lot of release, you've got a shorter, um, a longer duration. Like maybe that water flowing through through uh, hazard takes four days. Was it doing in those four days? Is how much is it warming up through through Keswick? So the model takes that into account. Uh, or you know, a shorter duration, higher flows. Uh, we need to make a TCD change. Let's say we see a heat wave coming, we've got to make a TCD change. Uh, higher flow, you're going to see a reaction downstream a lot faster. So there's there's gives and takes in terms of high flows, low flows. All right, so what's happening downstream again? Uh, you've got uh, air temperature or heat wave, right? It's 115 degrees at Redding. Uh, that's obviously gonna have an effect on uh, uh, what's going on downstream. So, uh, and then the distance, how far, where's our control point? When we're operating to uh, uh, a, a point, you know, right in Redding, that's a lot easier. It's a shorter distance below Keswick. But if you're talking about operating all the way down to 
to uh, Balls Ferry or Jelly's Ferry, that's definitely quite a distance. So there's um, there's that, that component that the model has to account for as well. So uh, it's kind of the short um, version of what we do. Randy's going to get into more detail on the, the future and you know what we're moving to. Um, this kind of shows all the components. Um, we're we're uh, this is a big part of uh, the temperature task group. So we're making model runs and uh, we're giving information to the science center. Science center is doing their runs as well. So we're bringing you know multi agency uh, modeling to the the group to look at and evaluate. Um, and to you know share ideas off each other. So um, even uh, modeling uh, for in a really dry year like uh, 2022, uh, even uh, on the Trinity side, we were doing modeling. Our, our agency modeling takes everything into account. It's looking at both the Trinity, the SAC, that inner diversion uh, between the basins. Um, it's looking at temperature modeling uh, down the Trinity as well. Obviously, Trinity doesn't have a TCD, so it's a little bit different there. Um, but we do have ability under really dry conditions uh, on the Trinity in the drought years. Uh, we've got um, participation from the from the tribes, Koopa, Yurok, that come in, and and uh, if there's uh, fishery issues, and, and along with our uh, our Weaverville office, the temperature uh, the restoration program for the Trinity, uh, they're heavily involved as well. So we're all getting together. So even under extreme cases, um, when it's really uh, um, tough in terms of temperature management, uh, we're trying to, to look at all the different components. And uh, so um, that's kind of the, the way we're doing things now. This is the, probably the last year we're running HTC5. And uh, I think Randy's gonna talk about starting next year, what we're gonna do or what we have been doing leading up to this point. Can you hear me okay? Um, so again, my name is Randy Till and I work with uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh, we're here to showcase uh, the tool set that we've been utilizing. And as Tom mentioned in the past, our legacy tools. Um, but I'm the future uh, to talk about here. As uh, so we're calling this the WTMP or the Water Temperature Modeling Platform for the Central Valley Project. And I'll start with the motivations. So there's two kind of underlying uh, components. Uh, first and foremost, as Tom mentioned, we've kind of reached the end of the life horizon of the legacy tools. Um, they're no longer being supported by some of the other agencies. Um, so we're we're looking to uh, move forward with with uh, tools and components that that have support. And the second um, major component here is that this was a specific uh, request in part of the biological opinions for reclamation to undertake a development effort. And um, we feel that this effort um, and its, its uh, products have fulfilled uh, that request. Uh, so we have a number of visions uh, for this particular project. Uh, First and foremost, deliver quality products to support Reclamation's mission and uh, predicting water temperature to support CDP operations. And uh, I think this underscores like this component really is to assist in the operational component. But at the same time, um, I think as you all have heard this, with this morning's talks and earlier sessions, uh, there's a lot of interest in knowing what may happen in the future before it happens. And so the, the, these are really the, the, the foundation of helping us get to that point. Um, we really wanted to modernize our uh, equipment, if you will, uh, for the CDP system wide modeling and analytics. Uh, we wanted to develop to current professional standards in a transparent fashion. We wanted to have consistency. This is addressing some of the criticisms we've received in the past. Look for that real time, the seasonal and long term planning capabilities. We'll get into that in more detail and, and why we, we needed to fulfill this commitment for consistency. Uh, I think one of the givens here is that 
within the environment that we work in, it is constantly changing. We know that from looking in the sort of short term past of what the regulatory environment has held for us. Um, so we want to make sure that the tools we're building today can accommodate the changes for the future. Um, we want, this is a new component here on addressing uncertainty. I think we've all uh, at least touched on many of the different talks today. There are unknowns within the system um, that we, we just don't have a good feel for. Uh, and what may happen, a lot of that is your auditory uh, uncertainty is with the neurology or the hydrology. Um, so these are components. This is something new for reclamation. And we want to highlight that as we go through this uh, brief talk. And, and more of the focus will be spent on where we're headed into the future. Um, so I hope uh, this is just infusing our enthusiasm for where we're going to land in and not look uh, maybe too hard or spend too much time on, on those legacy tools. Um, we also know that technology will change into the future. We want to leverage that. Um, I think we've got some good examples of how we're applying that right now with this new tool set. And then uh, another key component is building expertise. We want to make sure that we have those uh, people with the knowledge and, and information in order to keep this running into the future. Um, Tom was mentioning sort of a dwindling uh, professional knowledge set in one institution. We're really looking forward in the vision to expand this to others and make sure that we have a broad sense of agencies that are both informed and can be uh, utilize this particular tool into the future. Um, I have taken this uh, slide here on the development effort. I, I think the importance is not just what we've produced, but how we've produced it. Um, so this is from the California Development Water Modeling Forum. Uh, Modeling protocol. Uh, so this is slide just from there. They issued in the fall of 2021 uh, a, a, a set of rules, if you will, on how one should go about developing model tools. Reclamation was not interested in building anything from scratch. Um, so that top kind of bar that we're uh, describing there on uh, the collaboration here on theory and conceptual framework, we've left that to others. Uh, Reclamation contracted with a team uh, to develop this. We worked in, internally with Reclamation employees, worked collaboratively together in about a three and a half year time frame. Um, I think we had uh, selected a very capable contracting team who has a, a tremendous amount of experience in helping uh, develop temperature modeling and the frameworks uh, associated with that. Um, where we focused most of our time and attention was the center box on the technology and scientific collaboration. Uh, we have, in, in our opinion, uh, successfully completed uh, those components, but I, I do want to just uh, remind you that we have not actually gone to the full circle in application, and we are currently in the testing phase. So Reclamation is utilizing order year 2021 as an internal testing period. Um, so how does our development approach compare uh, to this point guidance? Um, you know, we spent a lot, again, a lot of time on the how. Uh, we, we have a very comprehensive um, piece of the, the framework selection. Uh, it, a lot of time was taken in just how we went about selecting the particular model. For, the, for use in the temperature model, water development in the Central Valley Project. Um, we have also done a lot of time on the setup. A lot of the uh, components that are critical are understanding the physical pieces of the system. And so what are the, the capabilities of that infrastructure set that we have uh, that was built way back in, in you know, sometimes the, the 50s or, or later. Uh, how do how those physical pieces interact with uh, the the realizations uh, given your input forcings in in temperature downstream. Uh, we're looking at a very comprehensive testing and addressing the uncertainty component. Uh, we are in, as I mentioned again, that model application in progress, currently doing the testing. And then we have also highlighted as an important feature 
um, producing high quality reproducible documentation. Um, we have uh, an example of where you can find that information a little bit later in the talk. And then uh, one of the most key components was the creation of what we called uh, the MTC, the Modeling Technical Committee, and uh, a peer review. So we met with a extremely broad and wide diverse group on a quarterly basis for three and a half years. We had 10 interactions um, of three, three hours each. Um, so culminating in about 30 hours of content. Uh, we had approximately 50 to 60 individuals who were consistently attending um, from a wide variety of backgrounds. So we're hoping that all of um, this front end energy helps us in the future, one, build a better product, so getting constant feedback from this group, and two, building confidence um, in its performance. Okay, so the WTMP, the Water Temperature Modeling Platform model domain uh, was widespread. The application was, um, I know we've focused a lot of the talk here today about uh, the Sacramento River, but really extends the three primary areas that our nation has interest in and, and knowledge for communicating temperature implications downstream from major reservoir systems. Uh, one is the northern system that we've been discussing today, uh, the American Basin and the Stanislaus Basin and the other two that we completed with this development effort. Uh, but for today's uh, purposes, we'll focus in on the Sacramento and Trinity River system. And the, these components were specifically selected because of the regulatory environment implications that Tom spoke about earlier for water rights. Uh, it's the Trinity River down to Helena, Whiskey down to Clear Creek Confluence, and then the Shasta Lake uh, complex down to Red Bluff. Uh, the WTMP, our project, does contain some fairly unique features. Uh, we do have key code modifications uh, within the, the development effort. Uh, and this is to make sure that we have captured the enhanced modeling considerations for our unique facilities. Um, and those include those temperature control devices, we have them at Shasta and at Folsom. Um, we also employ temperature cartons. Uh, so those, they're in Lewiston and Whiskey Town. And we do have on the, on the last remaining system another unique feature, which is a submerged dam in New Orleans Reservoir. Um, we also uh, wanted to highlight that the model domain captures all of the pertinent features in relation to how water temperature can be influenced downstream. Um, so I noticed that we have the Trinity and we have Whiskey Town. All, all those components, particularly for the Northern system, are captured within uh, the W2MP domain. Um, I think this next item, a model framework, is uh, also really key. Uh, we went in this direction. This is not something that we had addressed in the past modeling. But the modeling framework is really this idea that you have an environment in which alternate models, not just one model, but maybe two or three models and n models, could play, play, if you will, within the same playground with the same initial conditions and mountain conditions. And we'll talk about the specifics of what they are. Um, this is akin to how the National Willis Service, uh, I think, is somewhat. Um, uh, let's say agnostic about which models are are being utilized. I think they have up to like 50 or 80 models that they utilize for global climate um, predictions. These are all kind of indulged into a framework and they have um, you know initial conditions that are basically forcing those and getting results. But it, it's not to say that one particular model is better than another. You know, where Commission has a lot of experience with uh, maybe competing models in an arena. This offers us the ability to place models all within the same environment and, and tease out those results that are most powerful and beneficial to the situation. Uh, the analogy is that we frequently, when we consult with the meteorologist, they'll tell us that the, the GFS model in these certain situations is much better, but the European model is suggesting something 
alternate and you know it may be better to to weigh uh renewably on the results of looking from one particular model or another just because of the nuance of they're they're leaning towards a better simulation in one situation versus another. Um, so we think that this is exciting that we have an opportunity to collaborate with others. Um, we would be Eric uh, Danner, who spoke earlier, and in incorporating uh, the NIMS modeling uh, techniques and within the WTMP environment as a future potential here. Uh, another continued key feature in leveraging technology is what we're calling the data management system. Um, as you can imagine, there are a significant a number of pieces of information, particularly running this on hourly time step, um, which is an enhancement of moving from the HEC 5Q modeling um, of the past. And there is just a significant amount of information that you have to get every hour when you set this up has to have a feed. If, if you can't just ask the model, you know, you, you kind of missed a few pieces of information, you have to have the piece, you have to have, for example, a meteorological force in there at an hourly time step. And we're looking at doing temperature modeling for eight months up into the future. And so we'll talk about a nuance on, on looking to get that information uh, in a later, later slide. Uh, and then lastly, the communication and transparency, again, mentioning this technical committee uh, that we established. I think this has been extremely helpful in one, I think, broadening the, those that may have interest in becoming part of the WTMP capable uh, modeling family. Because um, again, I think we need to continue to build that expertise and share our, our or leverage our resources amongst one another in the modeling community in order to make sure that this has longevity into the future. Um, let's see, our uh, collaborative model development approach, uh, it really started this with the hypothesis that it would foster confidence, transparency, and trust, sort of this problem-solving synergy and have better model application. And so it's kind of, we wanted to thought that this was the idea that we would achieve these components into the future. Uh, and again, highlighting that we've created this group. Uh, they did have consistent engagement. Uh, we we offered them the timely uh, product reviews. That means every time we had a draft, it went out to the TMC and uh, we received feedback and incorporated that. Also it was helpful because of very uh, specific and constructive input as well as comments back on any of these internal pieces and certainly this is, these are very complex um now tools that we're creating and there you know other perspectives are certainly uh welcome in that development phase so you can address them early on um and then ultimately we think that this will foster a, a future user group that will continue on into the future All right so getting to the specifics um we have this setup here that we explained with the framework component. Um, we want to describe this as an element system and framework model. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have an example of an element model and highlighted in blue, it's representing a reservoir specifically and really nothing more than that. Um, so imagine it does closely remind itself with Shasta Dam. Uh, so as we move into the next slide, or sorry, the next segment in the center, which is the modeling system. Uh, you can see that multiple reservoirs and then the interconnections uh, from the, those reservoirs are uh, a, a component. So it's, it's like the broader picture, not just a single component. And then finally, uh, at the far uh, right, we have a modeling framework where you have the opportunity to mix and match. And I think this becomes a, uh, something that we will explore in the future. Uh, this affords us uh, with the definitions now of these components for utilizing the Army Corps of Engineers, AGC model products. Um, it is convenient for reclamation. They are located in Davis and we're in Sacramento. So it, uh, we did uh, also, this was a, a purposeful decision-making to make sure that we are close in contact with the developers. Uh, so the first one there, the element model, 
is a two-dimensional it's an equal to be two. Uh, so we have higher uh, complexity uh, capabilities. The center, center modeling system is going to be uh, captured with the HSC ResSim. So this is not only the reservoir systems, but the downstream components as well. And then the following framework is captured within the HSC Watt uh, watershed analysis tool. And here's an example of how uh, this ended up with uh, the Shasta uh, Northern System example. On the left hand side, we have resident only. Uh, again, again, this is the reservoir and the riverine components downstream. And then over on the right, we have the combined W2 and resident, where W2, the two dimensional model, is representing the larger reservoirs in the system and the RISM, the downstream riverine networks at the 1D. Uh, with this advancement and development for tools, um, as Tom was mentioning, our legacy tool set had some limitations and a significant one was the visualization of output. There really weren't any, um, uh, let's say, uh, developments that we had for our particular uh, application, but since uh, we have sort of fast forward in time, we have a lot of uh, accessories that we can uh, now utilize in our communication to, to our stakeholders and uh, our, our customers. Uh, we're also looking uh, to leverage the uh, capabilities for automating. Uh, so we have a lot of what we call cans, products, that can be easily and quickly generated as a push of a button, basically, from an output from a simulation. Uh, we, they're also flexible so that um, in the future, if there's desire for modifications and changes, and this is an easy way for us to provide and communicate information in a very fast manner. Um, and these can be very detailed. And in fact, we have uh, hundreds of pages right now. Um, of course, that can all be summed down to, to very summer, you know, quick summary reports. Um, but I, I think it kind of fills the full gamut of, you know, those that may be interested in particular components that are maybe a small, somewhat, uh, you know, unusual nuance to uh, the more general product line that our, our biologists and stakeholders are interested in. So uh, another key component was uh, the performance. And we, uh, because the, we are short on time, I didn't dive into the hundreds of, actually thousands of pages of calibration reports that we have available in the uh, appendices, but you're free to look at those. Uh, they're available online. But uh, just as a snapshot, we're looking at a W2, so they are 2D right, and single, uh, dimensional resin comparison of Shasta lake temperature profiles. And yeah, we're, we're uh, selecting one of the most challenging years, uh, 2014. And I think we're just getting a good snapshot of the profiles through time. These are matched up to the historically observed profiles. Um, and we're doing a fairly good job of, of that Upmost point in the reservoir system matching. And so, um, you know, as we go downstream, uh, again, no model has, that I have ever met has been perfect. Um, there will be challenges. And in this case, uh, you know, a lot of times we do see a somewhat uh, poor performance in, in some more challenging years. And I think there's some explanations for that. Uh, but generally, I think the calibration and evaluation or validation periods that we examined in the 20 year span, um, it yielded some very good results. And I think we'll just talk briefly about why we had a 1D and a 2D. So reclamation not only has uh, so this real time obligation, um, so that's your shorter term. Uh, we have other tools that can address that. Uh, Quickly, uh, this this model certainly can do that as well. It's longer term, seasonal. I'll call that in a one to eight month out uh, look ahead, but also planning purposes. And we've been able to utilize in the past this very nimble and fast computational HSC five Q model 
Um, so we're really desiring that in the future. So we're calling the RESM, our screening tool model, it is for us. So we have access to that. We have confidence now that are behaving similarly for both the 1D and 2D, but then we also have the 2D to go that deep dive if they're interested in asking different types of questions. So the WTMP activities um, surrounding this topic of uncertainty, I did want to touch on that again because it is something new, um, but we haven't fully explored the uncertainty. And I, I just want to highlight that if, in case you do take a deep dive into our documentation. Uh, we spent a lot of our time identifying the sources of uncertainty and uh, estimating and prioritizing them. Um, Part of this, uh, in, as we get in further to the next slide, I'll explain uh, how we approach this, but we're characterizing an aggregated uncertainty and model results coming out of the calibration component. And then we look at it in terms of forecast capability, and we don't look at the forecasting component yet. That is something that we hope to examine in full, full detail later. Um, but another component of this was to again, this idea of communicating. This is a challenging uh, arena or topic for us. And so if you have experience, um, I'm very interested as we have talked in our modeling community, communicating uncertainty to others and how this changes through time is really um, difficult. So um, we'll just share what we did do on, from the calibration and applying that within the mindset of moving into a forecast mode. We did explore that. We looked at the uncertainty of the model and its structural, com com structural component. Um, we looked at it, it's a parameterized temperature control device application. Um, so that is tuned, a tuned component within the model. And we also looked at that in terms of the methods that we apply our look aheads for meteorological and inflows into the system. When you go into the forecast mindset, you have to make assumptions about how, for example, to disaggregate a monthly inflow volume that we receive from one of our partner agencies, the California Nevada Global Forecast Center, or for example, the Department of Water Resources snow surveys. That monthly piece of information has to be turned into some sort of model-ready component, again, going back to that time step requirement, but you have to make assumptions from getting from point A to point B on that disaggregation. Those are what we're all capturing as kind of part of that calibration and forecast um, category. The future um, analysis will capture what that uncertainty is within those components, for example, the, the meteorological uncertainty or the hydrologic uncertainty. And a lot of people are very excited about that. I mean, I myself even zoomed straight to, all right, this is explaining to me what we have in the uncertainty in the system because of those, you know, things that we can't predict with weather, but uh, not yet. We're, we'll get there in the future. Um, and then for example, um, kind of switching topics, uh, the WTMP has integrated this uh, fairly elaborate data management system, but we now have a uh, dedicated quality control uh, data manager in order to help facilitate this for us. Um, it is uh, going to be stood up and deployed as a web service-based interface for data access. Um, so just going to that full uh, database management and utilizing or leveraging that piece of technology uh, to serve as the input and housing all of the information that we're using. So we hope that this is a showcase for how we're lifting uh, the bar, so to speak, for, for data quality into the future. Um, all of the data is contained within the database, so all the raw information. We, we are applying templates to overlay it for QA and QC. So that if there is ever any doubt in the future, all of that raw data is accessible and available for examination. And I think I think this is just that trust and confidence component that we want to continue on as part of that theme in, in the stretches here to the data management. Um, 
And then again, here we have uh, templates and then elements of the model associated well, with templates. Uh, we have this interconnection and linkage between the model itself to help facilitate, like, again, this automation. We do have a fairly elaborate workflow. Uh, we're getting our resources externally, um, in some cases from USGS, the California Data Exchange Center, and some of these components are coming from reclamation directly. They go into the WTMP uh, a database and then interact with those models within the modeling framework. And that's where the leakages are. It's going to go and talk directly to the DMS, the data management system from the PEC plot uh, framework interface. Um, I was asked to touch on our uh, wealth of information. So we do have a very uh, rich database, uh, excuse me, a, a rich uh, web base. Uh, documentation, uh, so we have the links available, all of our project fact sheets, uh, the modeling technical committee information, the agendas, the PowerPoint presentation slides, summaries of those meetings, the technical memorandums for all of the components of the development effort and additional references are listed there. Uh, we are still uh, posting the final uh, documents. Uh, so they are draft at this point in time that will be in the future uh, final. And here we have a list of all of these. Uh, we have the framework selection and de design selection, model selection components, a data management plan, data development, model development, calibration, validation, and sensitivity analysis, model implementation, and then two components of uncertainty, the sources and protocols. We do have some additional references, and they actually have been sprinkled throughout um, the earlier presentations. We have some very rich uh, visual uh, components that are within this technical reference on a selective which are I call it more of a kind of like the cartoon base. Uh, so it has a, a lot of a rich visual componentry um, and a lot of text as well, but mostly I think if you're looking for the, the picture that, that describes what the system uh, components are doing, I think this is a good reference uh, to access and, and use. We also, uh, part of our uh, goals in this particular project was to build confidence and reclamation uh, has an agency-wide uh, directive now for um, evaluating from a peer review or um, specifically a scientific uh, review standpoint. Um, as you are here in a different component or capacity, we subjected this particular project to two review cycles. Um, reclamation hosted or Reclamation partnered with the Delta Stewardship Council who hosted these two. We had a midterm and a final review on this, both of these are uh, available online and uh, we have some pretty significant, I'll call it sort of a career uh, highlight. Um, it's an extremely positive experience that we had and um, there were a lot of uh, rich information that the peer review panel members share with uh, for this particular project and effort. Um, earlier, uh, Peter mentioned that I've uh, been participating in a science and technology grant uh, project as well. The motivation for this is uh, the WTMP project. Uh, we're looking to get inputs that are useful and uh, value valuable for this particular effort. We realized early on that there was a need for improving um, approximately 15-year-old methodology that we had. It was cutting edge uh, at the time in the early two, 2000s. Uh, but it was time to revisit uh, how we received and processed the information from a genealogical standpoint. There's approximately seven different parameters that need to be fed in as forcing functions to the temperature models. And again, this is the challenge. How do you get eight months out of neurological information on an hourly time step? Or uh, in, in our prior case, six hourly time step. Um, so we partnered with the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We've got a principal investigator, uh, Dr. Andy Wood out of NCAR, 
that is uh, helping us or assisting with this particular project, evaluating uh, the, the meteorological inputs and how we might improve these things in the future. An, op an optional um, component to this project is to look at uh, inflow temperatures, um, which is another area in which we think is uh, could be enhanced for this particular modeling. Our next steps, um, again, we're for water year 2024, doing an internal investigation on testing the new tools and products. Uh, we'll be standing up our data management system within the reclamation environment. We hope to have a rollout in late 2024 uh, and a facilitated adoption of these tool, new tools and science uh, application in 2025. Uh, but we foresee this beyond just next year or that you know this development effort has terminated. We really think this will continue into the future because we have set it up, I think, well, uh, to evaluate the performance on an annual time step. You know, there may be questions about how um, future uh, climate may influence this it's a physically based model. We're hoping that that setup is amenable to that. Uh, we we hope that these this development effort also has uh, highlighted areas to improve data collection. Um, there will certainly be model refinements. Also, haven't met a model that doesn't need a refinement at some point in time, and certainly our system changes, so there will also be opportunities to make enhancement there. And then we'll reassess uh, our modeling needs. Again, this touches back on the flexibility, or building that flexibility in because it will continually change uh, based on the regulatory environment. Also expecting that sometime we'll have some sort of technological advancement that we'll need to address. And then we'll, we'll, we hope that this building of a user, users group also continues all of this and building our expertise for the, for the future. And that's the end of my session. And maybe it's best to take a break or... Uh, no, we're going to take a break for that. Okay. <laughs> Wait, can everybody hear me okay? Can you talk to a little bit more? Okay, is that better? Better. Okay, so um, I'm Elissa Buttermore. I work for the Bureau of Reclamation. I'm a fish biologist and um, in the Bay Delta office. And I'm just going to give an overview of um, some of the biological tools that we've been using to assess the effects of um, chest operations on salmon. Um, so we have a few ways in which chest operations affect fish survival, uh, which yeah categorizes our yeah, temperature versus flow effects. Um, and I was going to start off talking about the temperature dependent mortality or TDM, um, which Eric also talked about earlier today. Um, the noise level from next door. And they're getting home. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll try to talk a lot louder and closer to the microphone. And hopefully I won't cough on it too much. Right. Since <laughs> I have allergies. That's the next person's problem. <laughs> Some nice soil. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so temperature dependent mortality is a performance metric that we've been using for cold water pool management. Um, since the eggs are the most sensitive life stage, we can measure other related things like water temperature and the number of salmon reds. Um, but so TDM is really a modeled estimate. Um, there's 2D two TDM models that we use. Um, we've been using a yeah, stage-dependent and stage-independent um, mortality models. Um, you can use the same inputs for both, but they're based on different assumptions. So you typically get different results when you use the different models. Um, for the Martin model, the egg thermal tolerance is independent of the developmental stage. And then the Anderson model, 
it provides an input parameter that factors in uh, eggs needing more oxygen as they develop. Um, and they're, they're more, the eggs are more sensitive to temperature effects immediately before hatching due to the increased biological demand for oxygen. So these uh, TDM models provide estimates, but we can't like directly evaluate their, or been able to uh, um, evaluate their accuracy. Um, um, egg to fry survival rates are estimated by calculating the, the seasonal fry equivalent uh, juvenile production estimate based on fry equivalents at Red Bluff Diversion Dam and dividing the estimated number of eggs deposited in river um, winter run Chinook adult data are derived from carcass survey estimates and the average female winter run Chinook salmon fecundity data are obtained from uh, Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery. Um, so egg to fry survival is a performance metric that's tied to Shasta operations, but it's not exactly available until after temperature management season is over. Um, we don't really use it as much in uh, temperature management planning. Um, it's the egg to fry survival estimates included in the juvenile production letters that the winter run juvenile um, <laughs> The winter run JPE team develops and submits to the NIMFs, and the NIMFs also provides a letter based on that recommendation. Um, yeah, and a final um, egg to fry survival estimates provided um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service in their reports. Mm. So here we have um, early life stage mortality and survival for winter run Chinook salmon for each year. Uh, years on the x-axis, which is also categorized by water year type. So the critical years are in orange, the dry years are in yellow, uh, below normal years in black, above normal in green, and wet years are represented in blue. The y-axis is estimated uh, percent percentage of the winter run population. And so in these bars, the orange indicates the proportion of the egg to fry survival. Uh, blue represents temperature attributed mortality estimates and gray is uh, unattributed mortality or unknown mortality. In general, temperature-dependent mortality estimates are a larger um, proportion of mortality in years that um, we don't have a lot of water, like the critical years shown here. And TDM estimates are very low in wet years. Um, there's also a lot of unattri uh, unattributed mortality um, And the, yeah, the gray bars. Some years, TDM estimates can vary greatly from the start of the season in comparison to the TDM estimate at the end of the temperature management season. So this is showing um, in 2022, uh, the TDM estimates using the April forecast and um, historical winter run distributions as estimates. It ranged from um, 36 to 58%, depending on what models we used. Uh, um, the, the NOAA Science Center prevent, also provides um, these estimates and um, the figure on the left is uh, one of the figures from their CVP uh CV temp site that Eric um had a slide on. Um <clears throat> so yeah depending on what models we use there is a, a range. Um so graph the HEC 5Q um Martin versus Anderson model. Um 
But the Hein test estimate at the end of the season, uh, where we use actual winter run red distribution data and actual yeah, temperature data um, resulted in a TBM estimate of 18%. So some reasons for the change in the estimates over time may be related to the management actions, like, uh, reduced releases in May and June. Um, yeah, yeah, lower close that year in May and June. Um, while other factors are more related to uncertainty around expected conditions of the system, because um, forecasts use conservative estimates in April, we and we never exactly can predict the actual like hydrology and operations and meteorology. The model results are yeah not exactly as expected and to uh, precisely match actual water temperatures. And then we use uh, conservative inputs into the temperature modeling in April, and that results in a uh, well, some TDM drops over the season as less conservative conditions are observed. The figure on the right here shows water temperature forecast in orange, and then the observed water temperatures in green at Keswick. Um, so that's from January 2022 to October, or November 2022. Um, so there's, uh, there's yeah, a bit of a difference. In contrast, uh, 2023 was a very wet water year, and so the TDM estimates in April were very low, and the hindcast was also very low. Here's the uh, winter run salmon red temperature landscape graphic output. Um, this is from the SACPAS fish model web tool. It's an yeah, online tool that the University of Washington um, has developed. Um, but yeah, kind of yeah, similar to some of the graphics that the Science Center also provides. Um, so on the left here, we have results from 2022, and on the right are results from 2023. The x-axis here is month and the y-axis are water temperature and river kilometer. The circles represent winter run chinook salmon reds, uh, spatial and temporal distribution. And the size of the circles reflect the number of reds. The large with the larger circles indicating more reds at that time and location. Um, the red circles represent reds that were exposed to temperatures that exceeded the critical temperature during that hatching period. And the gray circles are reds that were not exposed to elevated temperatures during the critical hatch period. And then the dark gray line on the background indicates the critical temperature input, which we typically use uh, 53.5 or like 11.8 degrees Celsius, 53.5 Fahrenheit. Um, and then, so you can see in 2023, there weren't uh, any winter run reds that were exposed to water temperatures that exceeded the critical temperature threshold during the hatch time in 2023. So now I was gonna talk about um, some ways we estimate flow effects. Um, so salmon red dewater can be modeled and can also be observed um, for our long-term planning needs. Salmon red dewater uh, has to be modeled. Um, for in-season flow planning and management, winter run red dewater can be informed by real-time shallow red dewatering, but dewatering trade-offs for additional runs need to be modeled since they're no spawning letter in time. Um, so even using this uh, guard uh, 20, uh, 2006 method described in this Fish and Wildlife Service report, um, 
it's titled, yeah, Relationships Between Flow Fluctuations and Red Dewatering and Juvenile Stranding for Chinook Salmon and Steelhead in the Sacramento River between Keswick Dam and Battle Creek. The estimates are based on flows in which the spawning occurs, and then there's minimum flows uh, where the reds were subjected uh, to uh, prior to fry emergent, or those are the dewatering flows. Um, so, yeah, so historical spawn timing distribution and anticipated emergence timing can be used in conjunction with flow at Keswick to estimate what proportion of the population may be dewatered. This is a table of estimated proportion of fall run chinook salmon reds dewatered by year based on, um, and then also the field observations and model predictions in the upper Sacramento River. Um, the dewatering modeling results provide relative rather than absolute estimates of a uh, number of reds dewatered. Um, so it can provide a comparison when evaluating multiple alternatives. So it's really best used as a comparative tool rather than focusing on the specific dewatering estimate value because it's often overestimating the dewatering impacts. Um, and thanks everyone for your attention and for your help. Um, helping us to figure out how to improve our operations. That's all I have. Thanks, Larissa. Perhaps we can thank uh, all of your recommendations. Thank you. And then I could we switch the... the mics. I'm sure there's a, a lot of... I'm sure there's plenty of questions here. Uh, perhaps we can start with our own piece of temperature model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. They were all really interesting. Um, and it's exciting to like oh, wait for lunch. Um, one question is related to calibrating this kind of activity. Like, how do you, what's the strategy for calibrating? Um, and I guess it was the Randy first. What's the strategy for calibration when there are so many different components to this model? Um, and so that's the first question. And then the second question is you referred to the meteorological forces as being defined in the model framework by like seven different parameters. And I was just wondering when you were looking to forecast any of the future eight month scenarios. Where are you getting those data from, and how do you consider um, downscale and regional kind of model data? You run it to me. Great question. Okay. Okay. So calibration. Um, the these models were calibrated manually. Um, we do have as part of our future look um to perhaps do some uh, automated calibration uh, using models like Oscar. Um. So that's that's one uh, component that we may address in the future, but there's a significant benefit um, from our team, model development team. When you do the, the uh, calibration manually, you learn a lot about the modeling system as you go through that calibration before. Um, so the value is there, and because it is a large model and there may be some uh, challenges and setting up the objective functions for a, an automated approach. Um, but in this way, we found fairly good uh, performance by doing the manual approach. Um, this was both done for the resident model and this equality team model. Um, so this was a, a, a similar question that came up during the peer review panel. Um, and I think they were quite satisfied that uh, 
people might like to share as well, like there are pros and cons for both approaches. But in this case, uh, it did turn out that we did have a successful calibration of our, our evaluation in the sense community that suggests that we've done our performance fairly well, and all of a sudden, we actually fairly well compared comparatively between the leading and the TV model. Um, so I think that that's, um, and at least that's where we've landed for the present, but the future, there are still holds an opportunity for us to investigate something uh, with an automated sense. We have a small team. I think uh, doing things manually may be expensive, time, cons time consuming for a small staff. So that's why I'm going to investigate perhaps some kind of um, For your second question, uh, yes, absolutely uh, a challenge. The way we uh, approach this currently is we have from about the 1960s to, to uh, the most recent uh, extent of the, that drop period, so I think 2017, of historical neurological information. We have a, a methodology that uh, utilizes, and Tom suggested that the teams suggest what level of consultism they'd like to apply. In this case, we've been recently using the 25% of the teams. So they go to a fairly conservative, a warm climate selection. This tool goes back and selects uh, those months that fit the criteria of conservatism or um, and then stitches them together. So it's on a monthly time step. They basically are using the select both information and, and they're leading in one month together and not really take those plays as the person functional for their forecast. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try and squeeze in a few questions here, everybody. Joe, and then we have to evaluate the blue male and get by the fire here. It has been there since 86 or so, I think, right? And there was a different progression. So, get by the field also has been developed to some you know, high level. And now we go into a new model, which is good, like the framework, the dynamics are to a task computation. So, hopefully. My question is when you increase the sophistication, now we have gone to 1 d we're going to 2 d type uh, modules. When you increase the sophistication, that also increases the, the problem of parameterization. So the models could try to perform not good as the simple models. So did you check some of these scenarios with F5 here? For example, your your temperature parts, you have to check it with the W uh, W uh, What the comparison between this plus uh, between this and the existing model, so that we can say uh, quite comfortably this is what we call or could we do something some of you? Thanks. Absolutely, great question. Uh, this water year 2024 is our testing phase. We are hoping to have, as we go month by month this year, to compare directly between the HCC5T and the new modeling tools. So this year is the year that we will, will answer your question. Um, uh, and I think maybe one other component, you're absolutely right, we've not gone to the 3D, that seems like very computationally intensive, so <laughs> stick with the 2D. I'm very, again, very pleased that the 1D and the 2D modeling uh, with the newer model sets are coming out fairly comparable. Um, but the other one component that we did explore within the uncertainty analysis is this uh, notion of cumulative air aggregation throughout either the element model or in combination with the system model. And what we're finding, uh, thankfully, is that it is not like exponentially increasing as you move downstream in the system. I think we're very comfortable with the larger sources of air that we're finding within the system are where we would expect it, and, it, and it's not 
you know, as blowing up as you move down. So, okay. I think we're pretty confident. Um, on the temperature balloon, I appreciate the graph that shows the different water in the types and then the temperatures related to how the entire. I, I'm telling myself a story, but I'm not saying it's true, but I'm curious to give you perspective that we often in really dry years make decisions to change how we're managing temperature for winter run. And I'm curious <laughs> how much of a correlation there is between the mortality that happens in different water year types and the physical conditions and the mortality that happens in different water year types and the policy decisions. So that's one question. And then a related question is we've heard from some of the uh, people who provided input to the process in the previous meetings that there is a new body of thinking on what appropriate temperature requirements for a winter run are, and that maybe our current ones are not stringent enough. And in some of those graphs that you showed, it looked like were we to change the temperature requirements, we might have gotten into critical temperatures in certain circumstances. So I'm wondering if you all have done any kind of a, have thought about those new things that people are uh, waving their arms about and have looked back at any of this data and those new temperature requirements. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try. I'll try. So um I don't know too much about like uh additional ideas. I think the stage independent and stage independent both are really getting at the heart of like this dissolved oxygen hypothesis and the balance between the like this critical hatch period or not a critical hatch period, or maybe there's a critical dissolved oxygen period or temperature requirement during a different portion of the Incubation, gas relation, or you know, a like sac fry, right? Once they've emerged from the egg, but they have yet to be free swimming, right? So, um, I think you could develop a whole lot of hypotheses about that and get more information in the laboratory. But I think one of the things that uh, both of those studies lean towards is that it's important to try to find out and describe what's going on in the field. So I think that's probably a useful direction regardless of the policy. That's probably the useful science direction to go is to understand what's going on and feel better. And be trying to figure out a more um, a more complete model, like a more complete model for explaining some of the unattributed mortality. And perhaps that unattributed mortality is temperature attributed mortality. And we just don't know what the mechanism is or we developed the, the model, you know, parameterization is incomplete, but we don't have any better data now to do better, so to speak, with trying to get at like the critical temperature or a hatch window uh, or any other environmental covariate driver. So, but I don't, I don't know about your uh, second question about the like specifics of what the temperature criteria people are talking about. And I think probably the best thing to do would be to just try to get more observations so we can make, try to understand it better since it is very important to a lot of folks. Final question for the break. Thank you. Uh, I think this is two probably quick questions about the, based on Alyssa's charts. Um, first one is, one of the charts showed it was showing mortality showed very similarly low survival levels in 2021 and 2022 but the, the bottom part of the chart looked very different with one year having much higher uh, temperature attributed mortality than the other and i'm wondering if that's 
uh, it was back to the, that one. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's a meaningful difference or if that's just what Josh was just alluding to about it being hard to attribute. Um, and if it's in, yeah, so that's question one. And then question two, I, some of the later charts, it looked to me if I was reading them right, like temperatures in the river were going up significantly in October and even into November. And I wondered if I was seeing that right, if I am seeing that right, why that happens. Um, and if it is happening, if again, if it matters. So the the first question was about the difference between 2021 and. That's right. You need to be a Um. Yeah, there were some recent years where um, the air temperatures were actually uh, where we had um some really serious uh, wildfires that. So that had a big effect on our temperature management because it blocked out the sun. And so um, TDM was um, yeah much lower than we anticipated. Um, so that might have been, uh, I'm forgetting which years are which, but yeah. Um, and I think I forgot what the second question. The second one was about rising temperatures. Going up the fall. Going, yeah, a significant um, rise in temperatures in October. Slides because I did slides. Keep going forward. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Significantly higher in October, November. I could have just that. Yeah, uh, what? Yeah, let's see. What years was the? Yeah, was 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 yeah. Cold water pool is gone. Yeah, we've diminished the cold water pool, and we've lost control, and we. You know, it's it, that's what's coming out of the lake. We don't have no uh, ability to withdraw any colder water at that point. Yeah. So a, a hot fall can definitely cause some issues. So um, that's something we try to talk about and, in, in, you know, way in terms of, uh, you know, if there's a, like last year was a great year. It was, we didn't even use the side gates last year. And the temperatures through the fall were, were nice and cool. So, Obviously, in a drought year, there's trade offs. Well, thank you. And uh, we just thank the reclamation speakers again for that. Very We're going to take a break now. We're going to come back at 3 20. So you could be here promptly. Yeah. So that's uh, five minutes later than the formal agenda shows. I'd also like to remind folks, if anyone would like to speak during the open mic session, uh, if you're online, please email Maya uh, at the National Academies. If you're here uh, and wish to make comments, please, the sign-up sheet is out outside this room. So see you all at 3.20.